I'm very excited about our next speaker. He is a distinguished professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He works at the cutting edge of big philosophical questions around animal cognition and artificial intelligence. So think non-human intelligence. I'm also told by the TED folks who've had much more opportunity to interact with Colin than I have, that he's one of the most joyful people on Earth. So let's hear why. Please welcome Colin Allen. All right, I hope everybody's having fun. I made it up the stairs without falling flat on my face, so that's a good start for me. And, and that, if it had happened, might have given some of my students schadenfreude, a word I'm sure you've heard about. But I actually want to give you another word that you might not have heard before, which is freudenfreude. It's actually not a really German word. It's an English made-up word. Uh, and anybody who's had small kids, presumably most of you, will recognize what it is. It's the joy we take in the joy of others. Um, and of course, if you've owned dogs, You've also seen this, you've experienced this, watching the rough and tumble play of dogs in the park. So I'm here to tell you about a project in which we are trying to take on scientifically the question of joy in animals. But of course, attributing joy to animals is something that would be considered by many people just an unwarranted anthropomorphism, a projection of human-like qualities onto uh, things that don't possess them. Um, and I am a philosopher by training. I am a natural scientist by inclination. Um, and as such, I come from a long line of professional skeptics who would tell you exactly this anthropomorphism has no place in science. Beginning with Descartes 400 years ago, who told us that animals are just unthinking, unfeeling machines. And 300 years later, the famous uh, psychologist B.F. Skinner, radical behaviorist, said that these notions have no place at all in science. But a lot has changed since these two killjoys, who probably weren't much fun at parties, um, uh, w w uh, wrote these things. And now, as we've already seen, there are much more willingness among philosophers and scientists to think about animal minds in, in serious ways. Um, now, a lecture on joy might seem as not funny as a lecture on jokes would be, but I am going to press on regardless because I think we have a lot to gain. Um, but before I get to what we're doing, I have to admit that Skinner and Descartes had a point. That is, it, it is the case that science pr pr primarily is concerned with objective phenomena, things that we can describe and, and study objectively, whereas these mental states are subjective, and it's difficult to know how to fit that subjectivity into our objective scientific worldview. Um, it's also the case that when we go to animals, we can't ask them about their freude or joy in so many words, right? We have to find out in other ways. And it sure seems as though animals have the ability to, uh, to show us what they're feeling. But of course, the, uh, the, uh, the appearances can be deceiving. So there are studies that show that people are actually quite bad at judging the emotions of their dogs. Um, and so we have to be careful, we have to proceed cautiously. Here's another example. You might be familiar with the so-called smile of the dolphin, but it's not a smile at all. The dolphins lack the musculature to change their faces. And chimpanzees, primates in general, uh, sometimes show their teeth and pull their lips back like this, but it's not a smile, it's actually a, a display of fear, frequently misunderstood by non-experts. And where do you even begin with a parrot like this? <laughs> So my colleagues on this project, who are shown here, Jimena Nelson at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, Alex Taylor of the uh, Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, Erica Cartmill at Indiana University, uh, Heidi Lynn at University of South Alabama, and Vincent Yannick, who's at uh, University of St. Andrews, have set ourselves the challenge of bringing animal joy into uh, an experimental paradigm where we can study it systematically. <coughs> I'm the philosopher in the group. They get all the fun of working with animals, but scientists are animals too, so I get some of that fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, you might think that, aren't we just showing the obvious? Isn't it just obvious that animals feel joy? And if philosophers and scientists have tied themselves in, up in knots, 
trying to make sense of this. Doesn't that just show how joyless we are? Um, but nevertheless, I, I want to convince you that it's worth going forward. And actually, I think better than thinking about uh, trying to define joy up front, what we're doing is something like inventing joy. Now, that sounds really pretentious too, because why do we need to invent something that so plainly exists? But here's where knowing something about the history and philosophy of science, I think, can help. So Hasok Chang, who's a historian and philosopher of science at the University of Cambridge, wrote this great book, Inventing Temperature, in which he explains how it took over 100 years of hard work to come up with reliable ways of measuring temperature. And it was started in a situation where nobody really knew what heat even was. Was it a fluid? We talk about heat flowing after all. Or was it some negative weight substance? Because when they burned things, they got lighter. So you might have heard of phlogiston that was supposed to be the heat leaving the, the burned object. All right? um, so 100 years of work, and it wasn't even guaranteed that it would be successful. It could have turned out that heat was like, or temperature was like, hardness, where it turns out that if we measure it in different ways, such as how much impact, uh, d how much dent will come from an impact or scratch test, we get different orderings of, of substances accordingly. So I think we're in a very similar situation with respect to joy. We kind of recognize it when we see it, Right? We have some rough and ready characterization. These parrots playing on the roof of a car in New Zealand seem to be having a good time, but we don't know if it'll turn out to be the same thing in all of the species that we study. And so the task that we've set ourselves is not to give you a definition of joy up front. That comes at the end of our research, but rather to try to get this phenomenon under enough measurement and experimental control that we can investigate it systematically. Right? At the end of that, come up with a better theory. That said, we're specifically interested in that kind of immediate burst of joy that happens when something good really happens. And so what we have done is taken situations where that kind of burst seems to occur, typically that's play, and thought about where else it might occur. And we have therefore, we're engaging in a kind of exploratory research, a kind of research which is trying to figure out what buttons can we push to make things happen and do it reliably, rather than a hypothesis-driven research, which might be the kind that you're more familiar with. So my colleagues and I have come up with what we've called a windfall test, or a windfall paradigm for the experiment. And the idea here is that we want something that's generic enough to be tried with these animals that have rather different bodies, rather different lifestyles, and rather different preferences, a common task that we can give to all of them that's modified to suit their different abilities. And so what we do is we have them do a somewhat repetitive task in which they get a minimal sort of reward. So for a parrot, it might be a sunflower seed, and for a dolphin, it might be a fish. Parrots don't like raw fish. And then after five or six repetitions of this, they get something unexpectedly good. So the the dolphin might get six fish instead of one. The parrot will get a dollop of peanut butter, as you see on the screen, um, and that's great. This is terrific. That's a windfall. That's exciting, right? And the question is, what happens next? Do they vocalize in a particular way? Does it affect their decisions in other kinds of situations we can put them in? And that's what we're investigating. So these sounds are also important. The parrots have a warble. The chimpanzees actually have a thing called laughter that I'll play for you in a moment. We really don't know of dolphins, whether they have a distinctive uh, vocalization that they give in the kinds of circumstances that we're interested in studying. But I'm going to play you a short clip here of chimpanzees laughing, just in case you haven't heard this before. And you'll have to listen quite carefully. It's a kind of a <sighs> panting sound. Now, that, that screech there was not <laughs> a fun sound, but it was immediately followed by the laughter again, right? So we are interested not just does laughter arise in situations that are good, but can it also maintain or persist, or give a mood which continues that joyful state? Um, between the laughters, the warbles, and the victory squeals. And in doing so, we're going beyond play. 
we're, we're going beyond play to look at situations where animals can be uh, expressing certain kinds of emotional states and, and seeing whether or not we can see whether these vocalizations and whether their decision making interact with each other in ways that aren't immediately obvious from just seeing the initial response. So this is some preliminary data of the effect of laughter on the decision to approach a neutral stimulus that could be something good, could be something bad, and we show that merely hearing laughter in the chimpanzees causes them to be more likely to approach that neutral stimulus. But we also have to worry about whether or not the, what we're seeing here is, a, is a just arousal, just excitement, that it's actually positive rather than negative. So a new technique that we're applying here is the use of thermography to try to measure changes in body temperature. And with the birds, that's quite high, so we have to, uh, quite difficult because of the feathers. So we have to look around the eyes. With the chimpanzees, it's more of the whole body. Their, their heat is a bit more exposed. But the basic finding is, that we seem to be getting is, yes, we can tell positive arousal from negative arousal because the temperature changes are different. Now, there's been a lot of work on animals with negative emotions because of their obvious clinical significance. So fear and anxiety have been widely studied in animals, but we think there's a lot to be gained by shifting to studying positive emotions, both for human welfare and for animal welfare. But this is the beginning of a long road, and I particularly want to thank the Templeton World Charity Foundation for having the vision to support such far-sighted work. So thank you. Thank you.